morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again for today's session. Today, we're going to be looking at adverse possession and the implications for residential conveyances. I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by Ian Quayle and my colleague, Robert Kelly. Good morning to you both. Morning, everyone. Morning, Stephen. Morning. Um, before I hand over to Ian, I'd just like to go over a few items as per usual, just so you can participate in today's event. If you're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, you can just select the telephone option in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity to submit quest questions to Ian uh, and myself by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send these questions in at any time during the presentation. And we will collect these and address them during a Q&A at session at the end of today's presentation. You can also raise your hand during the presentation if you're having any difficulties with the sound or other technical issues. Um, please also do get in touch if you would like to speak to Ian, uh, myself or Robert directly, and we can unmute you. Just raise your hand and let us know you'd like to ask a question directly over your microphone. Finally, we've included the notes for today's session uh, in the notes section of your control panel. I say notes, I think it's a section called handouts for most of you. So please take a look there if you'd like to, to download the notes. We've also included some links to our YouTube channel and our LinkedIn page. Uh, our LinkedIn page has details of all the webinars we run and news of our products uh, that we're launching. And on YouTube, you can find recordings of the previous webinar sessions we've held, as well as walkthrough guides of our online ordering portal. Anyway, that's enough from me. I will now pass you on to Ian for the main part of today's presentation. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yes, yeah, so what we're going to do today is have a scamper through some issues relating to adverse possession from the perspective of a transactional property lawyer. What I want to get over here is a number of issues. One, uh, advice that should be given to the paper title owner to prevent adverse possession claims. Uh, again, just in outline, what we should do if our client uh, paper title owner is subject to an adverse possession claim and to looking at how adver adverse possession can impact on us in connection with transactional work. So lots and lots of things to talk about. In short, to start with today, we need to think about just what adverse possession is and how it is an issue in connection with conveyancing. And the first thing is, as I think should be our sort of mantra, no matter what sort of resi conveyancing we're doing and not, no matter what level of experience we have, we should always be thinking about the fact that we should be buying property on behalf of our clients and not buying litigation. And therefore, with regard to adverse possession, of course, there's a litigation risk in that to try and defeat or oppose a potential adverse possession claim. We could be looking at proceedings for trespass or seeking an injunction against a neighbour who's encroached onto our title. We could be looking at litigation relating to uh, an adverse possession claim being referred to a first tier tribunal on the basis that the adverse possession claim is in dispute. And we could also be looking at um, litigation relating to seeking rectification of a paper title where a successful ad adverse possession claim has been made in the past. So there is a significant litigation risk relating to adverse possession claims. In connection with negligence claims against conveyances, fortunately, there isn't that much exposure other than, I suppose, if we were to buy a property where there was an adverse possession issue and not advising our client of that issue, that would expose us to the potential for a negligence claim. Um, just before I leave this, I, this point of litigation risk, there is a point that I want to make. Um, again, if we're acting on behalf of a lender and there's a potential problem with regard to adverse possession, clearly that would be a matter that needed to be reported to the lender. And the way the lender hopefully would practically deal with the issue was to identify whether or not the strip of land really was material in connection with valuation. So surveyor or valuer, would need to be aware of the issue that we've identified as well as lender. So where the lender has a valuer, it's important that the lender's valuer is aware. If our client has a surveyor or valuer independent of lender's surveyor or valuer, that surveyor or valuer would also need to be aware of the problem. Um, the other issue with regard to adverse possession is that it can leave, leave a, a nasty taste in the mouth in connection with neighbours. So, uh, you know, the fact that we are buying a property and there is already a dispute with a neighbour concerning boundary location or risk or claim of adverse possession is not going to augur well for the future. It also generates problems with regard to an inability to correctly identify 
boundaries, as we'll see a little later, and of course will mean that we are unable to produce for our client via a complete title. Uh, and again, therefore, although the strip of land that may be subject to the adverse possession claim may be minute, may be of little or no relevance from a valuing perspective, may be of significant uh, interest or concern to our client in connection with acquisition. So I think no matter how we look at it, adverse possession creates problems in the context of transactional work. And therefore, it's important that we understand how an adverse possession claim can be made. It's important that we understand how it can be dealt with. And it's important that we understand the consequences of an adverse possession claim in connection with the title that is lost and the title that is gained. Relevant law is contained in the Limitation Act 1980, particularly relevant with regard to unregistered land, highlighting the fact that a 12-year period of uh, uh, adverse possession is required in order to uh, generate a cause of action or a right of action. Important to understand that what a possessory title does is, a, is in essence, extinguish a paper, owner type, a paper owner's title. It's important to understand that there may have been historically human rights issues with regard to a loss of title. All those human rights issues have been ventilated before the courts on a number of occasions, and I think it's fairly settled now that the Land Registration Act 2002, the Limitation Act 1980, create a, a, a numerous appropriate safeguards for the paper title owner to intervene and to object and to stop an adverse possession claim that it is impossible and unreasonable to rely on infringement of human rights as any form of defence to a claim for adverse possession. I mentioned in the notes that, in essence, there are one or two issues relating to historical adverse possession claims that we must be aware of. Uh, and the point that I make on slide here is the point really that I want to address, namely, we do need to watch out for old adverse possession claims. In other words, where adverse possession can be established for a period of over 30 years relating to unregistered land on the basis that if that is the case, then the circumstances are that the adverse possessor will be entitled to be registered as proprietor of the land courtesy of the 1980 Act rather than the 2002 Act. Uh, other points that I think are significant by way of introduction it is important to understand and appreciate that the Land Registration Act 2002 has changed the position relating to adverse possession of registered land quite dramatically. And in essence, is heavily reliant on the paper title owner challenging the adverse possession claim. So a fundamental and basic point that I've bleated about in the past and I will continue to bleat about until the day I die or retire is the need to make sure that we are telling clients who are acquiring registered lands to keep addresses for service at the land registry up to date. A failure to do so will mean that the safety net prescribed by the Land Registration Act 2002, enabling the paper title owner to challenge an adverse possession claim and in essence to block it, except in three circumstances, will be lost. Dealing with a matter just currently where someone is alleging that a failure to advise the client of the need to keep addresses for service up to date uh, generated a negligence claim. And it's an interesting one, not as yet resolved and unlikely to go to the courts, but I think we can fairly safely say that a failure to advise a client prior of the need to keep addresses for service at the land registry up to date has the potential to generate a negligence claim against the purchaser's conveyancer or solicitor. The next thing I want to talk about are the requirements for adverse possession. And there are a number of points here that I think are significant. Firstly, we'll look at the sort of basics and then we'll have a look at some of the sort of peculiarities of adverse possession. Before I do that, I have mentioned in the notes about Schedule 6, Paragraph 1.1 of, uh, of the Land Registration Act 2002, stating, of course, that it is necessary for the period of adverse possession to be established by the adverse possessor is a period of at least 10 years. Interestingly, if the claim is being made with regard to Crown Foreshore, that period of time is extended to 60 years, and the period of time ends on the date of application. Again, I've given you some detail with regard to foreshore claims. I wouldn't too worry too much about that, unless, of course, we're buying coastal property. It is necessary to establish, with regard to adverse possession, another important preliminary point, namely that 
you do have to watch out for adverse possession claims where the adverse possessor has been subject to ev eviction proceedings by the registered proprietor or a person claiming title from the uh, registered proprietor. Because in those circumstances, it is necessary to establish that adverse possession is claimed not more than six months before the date of application. In other words, eviction wasn't pursuant to a judgment for, to, for possession, and it is also important to establish the position relating to eviction. So just to clarify, because I was a little bit confused with regard to that statement, I'll make it again. Necessary to establish with regard to an adverse possession claim if there has been a claim for eviction by the registered proprietor or a person claiming under the registered proprietor for the application for adverse possession to be made not more than six months afterwards. So we've got a six month window after we've been evicted to bring a claim for adverse possession. I should have said that in the first place, shouldn't I? It would have made it a lot simpler for everyone to understand. So do watch out for eviction claims and also with regard to neighbour encroachment cases, there's an additional twist that we need to think about and need to consider. Again, before I delve into the particular points on this slide, there are some other points that I want to make to you, namely that adverse possession can't be claimed by an overseas company which has been dissolved or a company registered under the Companies Act which has been dissolved and where there's been disclaimer by the Crown or Royal Duchy. On the issue of disclaimer by the Crown, interesting point, what happens to the title? In essence, it goes into a sort of sump. Uh, it is still, in essence, owned by the Crown but the Crown is not liable for any loss arising from its ownership. It's quite a peculiar point. So let's dwell on the points that I think are, are more significant and more interesting really, really from a practitioner's perspective. The thing that we really need to get our heads around in order to advise the client about the pro pro potential for success of an adverse possession claim or the potential for defending an action. The first point that we've got to establish is factual possession for at least 10 years. And here, let me explain that it isn't necessary to fence off land to claim factual possession. Significantly less than that, in essence, is required. If it has been fenced off, then that is good evidential proof, in part, of factual possession, but it isn't necessarily conclusive. But just because land has not been fenced off does not mean that adverse possession won't be possible. So we need to establish factual possession. And that requires as stated in the case of Powell and McFarlane and in Pye against Graham, this idea of single and exclusive possession. It is possible for joint uh, owners or potential joint adverse possessors to bring a claim, but there must be single possession exercised on behalf of several persons jointly. So it is important to understand that, in essence, there isn't anyone that is capable of intruding on the land or intruding on the rights of the potential adverse possessor. It is also important to understand that with regard to factual possession, there's also a requirement of an intention to possess. Both aspects are required to be established. And when we talk about an intention to possess, it is vital that the adverse possessor provides evidence of their intention, their state of mind relating to possession. Absolutely critical that that point is dealt with in any application. I state in the notes that enclosure is usually strong evidence of an intention to possess, but it isn't necessarily conclusive. And I've also given you an interesting case, recent case, of Amirtharaja against White which highlights a number of issues with regard to an adverse possession claim, the most obvious and the most compelling point I think we can derive or take away from that case is the fact that the intention to possess and the factual possession must be unequivocal. So if there is a possession that could be akin to the use of a right of way, or if there could be some form of use of a right of way that is sort of manifesting itself or um, metamorphosizing into uh, an intention to adverse possession if you are an adverse possessor it's very dangerous to formulate either of those arguments 
uh, in tandem with a claim for adverse possession because it will defeat the adverse possession. The factual possession and the intention to possess must be unequivocal. Absolutely essential that we follow those points. In addition to that, it is also necessary to establish that there's been possession without the owner's consent. So any suggestion of a license, any uh, contractual relationship between the adverse possessor and the paper title owner is potentially going to be fatal. And again, that isn't necessarily a, a need or requirement for documentation. It's any evidence that the owner has consented to the occupation is likely to create problems. Of course, the difficulty with that is that where the paper title owner does not intervene in connection with the adverse possession claim, uh, if the adverse possessor contends that he hasn't had the owner's consent, the land registry is not going to be any the wiser as to the position, which again harks back to the point that I made earlier. It is absolutely essential that we ensure that our clients are aware when they're buying property of the dangers of adverse possession and the need to intervene if an ad adverse possession claim is being made. <clears throat> I mentioned in the notes some important case law in connection with this idea about the intention to possess. I mentioned a case called Buckingham County Council against Moran. It's quite an old case, 1988. What was said in this case by Judge Hoffman, as he was, um, is that it's not necessary to establish an intention to own or acquire ownership, but simply an intention to possess. So the court was highlighting there with regard to factual possession and an intention to possess, the bar is quite low. In connection with possession without the owner's consent, the moment that there is an inkling that consent was provided, requested, or was or did in fact exist, the bar then is quite high for the adverse possessor to establish a claim for adverse possession. Of course, again, as I mentioned in the notes, that uh, possession is never adverse if there is any occupation of the land where the owner of the paper title has consented or where anyone deriving title under the paper, owner, uh, paper title owner has consented. So you can't be in adverse possession against the owner of the paper title where there is any form of permission or consent in existence. All of these issues would have to be established by an adverse possessor. So again, Although, as a transactional property lawyer, I'm not for the life of me suggesting that we get involved in assisting clients in connection with adverse possession claims, it is important that where a claim is being made, and we're on the periphery as far as a transaction is concerned, that we understand the requirements of an adverse possession claim and the need, courtesy of a statement of truth, to establish all of these issues. I'll deal with more on this a little later in my presentation. I mentioned another issue that I think is important by reference to um, the case of Rashid against Nasrullah in 2018, because this case highlights the fact that it is possible to bring an adverse possession claim in connection with land that you own, as long as the claim also relates to other registered or unregistered title. So you can't bring an adverse possession claim in connection with title that you already own. Uh, Rashid against Nasrullah sort of confirming that, uh, having explored the earlier approach that I've mentioned in the case of partial and Hackney. So in those circumstances, uh, in that earlier case of partial against Hackney, uh, Lord Justice Mumley said that owners of one of the properties weren't in adverse possession as their possession of the disputed land was referable to their registered title. In other words, they had an easement over land that they were claiming adverse possession for. And Lord Justice Mumley said, well, hang on a minute, you can't do that in that, in essence, you have a right over the land in question by way of your ownership of a dominant tenement. That, in essence, is the point that really I'm exploring but just highlighting the fact that if you have a title or a right over a title, then generally speaking, that will preclude you from making an adverse possession claim. I 
mentioned in the notes, and again, I mentioned a little earlier, the point that adverse possession can't be claimed against dissolved overseas companies or dissolved British companies. Uh, in connection with British companies, the position would have to be that the title has been disclaimed by the Crown. It is also not possible to claim adverse possession where the registered proprietor is an enemy or detained in enemy territory, or where the registered proprietor is unable because of mental disability to make decisions about the kinds to which an application for an adverse possession claim would give rise. Now, this is an important point to dwell on. When I mention on the slide that we're talking about lacking capacity, it's a little bit more specific than that in concept, but wider than that in application. The Land Registration Act refers to the fact that the proprietor must be able, unable because of mental disability, without clarifying what mental disability means, but then refers to the fact that the disability must prevent the registered proprietor from making decisions relevant to the adverse possession claim or is unable to communicate decisions because of disability or physical impairment. So this leads me to a point that I think is significant. If we're acting for a paper title owner who is suffering from some form of physical disability or mental impairment such that they can't give you or anyone else proper instructions as to their stance relating to an adverse possession claim, then they are not an appropriate paper title owner to whom or against whom a claim can be made. Interesting point this. If you're acting for an adverse possessor in your application, it would be possible to tell if a paper title owner is a company that's been dissolved. Um, it would not necessarily be open to the applicant to be aware of the physical or mental state of the paper title owner, in which circumstances it would be someone acting on behalf of that party uh, intervening in the process to explain to the court and indeed the, sorry, to explain to the land registry and in, indeed the applicant the state and condition of the registered proprietor, which would then block a claim. It is also important to understand that as far as a, a claim is concerned, if the applicant, if our potential adverse possessor is a defendant in proceedings which involve asserting a right to possession of the land, so we've sought a declaration of the court or first tier tribunal as to ownership of land, or judgment for possession has been given in favour of the paper title owner against the applicant in the last two years, again, that would preclude a claim for adverse possession being made. There's another peculiar thing that I want to talk about, which is frequently missed in connection with adverse possession claims, which I think is significant. The Land Registration Act 2002 makes it quite clear that adverse possession cannot be brought if the estate in land was held on trust at any time during the period of 10 years ending on the date of application, unless the interest of each of the beneficiaries in the estate was an interest in possession. That, generally speaking, will preclude uh, a trust that is a sort of co-ownership trust, um, a sort of standard sort of family or matrimonial acquisition, but would include the sort of family trust that we see from time to time. In those circumstances, a claim can't be made against the trust unless all of the beneficiaries had an interest in possession. So the significance of that, and that's Schedule 6, Paragraph 12 of the Land Registration Act 2002, is that you can't make a claim for adverse possession where at any point in that 10-year period, the registered proprietor was dead and their estate was being administered, the registered proprietor was bankrupt and the property was being administered by a trustee in bankruptcy, or the proprietor was a company which was being wound up. The case for that is a case called AS against CK Construction Limited, 1976 case, uh, which confirms that assets of a company are held in trust uh, in favour of creditors. So again, it's important to understand that where we're looking at adverse possession claims, it's important to determine the status of the paper title owner, because that status may well preclude 
an adverse possession claim from being made. That runs, co runs completely separately to a point that I've made to practitioners on a number of occasions in the past. A determined boundary application will stop the clock running in connection with an adverse possession claim. So where someone has been in possession of land that's disputed for, say, 10 years, to stop the 10-year period uh, expiring, a determined boundary application will stop the clock ticking and will, in essence, freeze the uh, period of adverse possession at that point. A determined boundary application made after an application has been made to the land registry for adverse possession will not stop the process. Someone emailed me over the weekend about that very point, and uh, I had to advise them, unfortunately, the boat had been missed in those circumstances. Determined boundary applications are great during the period adverse possession before a claim is being made. A determined boundary application being made after that point isn't going to have any effect at all in connection with the adverse possession claim. In the notes, I talk about procedure relating to adverse possession. So I can just skip along for a moment or two if I can. Uh, yeah, there we are. Yeah, here we are. Right. And this point that I made at the start of my presentation, I think, is key. There is a presumption from the land registry that all registered proprietors are bright, sitting at home, sitting at their desks, waiting for emails or communication from the land registry, and then immediately instructing solicitors to do whatever is necessary to defeat an adverse possession claim. So the Land Registration Act 2002 creates this sort of uh, machinery that comes into play where registered proprietor immediately reacts and takes offensive action or defensive action with regard to an adverse possession claim. Where there is inactivity on the part of the registered proprietor, the Land Registration Act 2002 assists the adverse possessor. It is therefore essential, one, that we tell clients about addresses for the service. There is a further potential problem that, again, a lot of practitioners are not aware of, which scares me to death. Where an application is made for adverse possession, and it is rejected by the land registry, it is important to understand the consequences of that rejected application. It, in essence, sets an indicator or a warning sign for the registered proprietor, because if nothing is done after the first application with regard to the alleged adverse possession or the potential adverse possession, where the adverse possessor sits quietly and does nothing for a period of two years, then Schedule 6 of the 2002 Act makes it a relatively simple exercise for the adverse possessor to make a second application. And where a second application is made in those circumstances, the opportunity to challenge or object to the application is lost. In short, the second application goes through the land registry process on the nod. So what should you do if there's the slightest inkling of an application being made to the land registry that is rejected? Well, either you bring proceedings for trespass or you regulate the position with regard to the adverse possessor or you um, make a determined boundary application if that is possible on the basis that the original application was rejected due to a time, uh, a, a, due to the appropriate period of time not uh, have ended. Now, you're going to ask a question, which is a fair question to ask. How do I know if an application has been made for adverse possession that has been rejected by the land registry? Well, there are two sources of information. Firstly, if you got the hint that there had been an application, then the land registry will have records. Secondly, if the paper title owner was aware of the original application, the paper title owner should disclose the position in a TA form. But there is a danger that the land registry hadn't kept records, the paper title owner wasn't aware that an application was made, never mind that it had been rejected. And therefore, there is this hidden danger of an original application being rejected 
and an adverse possessor making a second application. So do be careful about the slightest hint of a historical application being made, being disclosed to you in any way, shape or form. If there had been a rejected application that you were not aware of, then I wouldn't worry about it. There's nothing you can do as a conveyancer. You're not negligent for failing to make investigations with regard to has anyone made an application to claim adverse possession relating to this title. You're not going to be in a position to find out if that is the case. But rejected applications are potentially dangerous, particularly if you or your client is aware that an application has been made. Remember that the registered proprietor has an opportunity to object. And where that application is subject to an objection from the registered proprietor, then the position is that the application will be rejected out of hand by the land registry, unless the applicant can establish one of three grounds. Firstly, an estoppel arises. It's unconscionable because of an equity by estoppel for the registered proprietor to seek to dispossess the applicant and the applicant ought in the circumstances to be registered as proprietor. So that would involve some form of acquiescence or some form of knowledge and non-reaction. The second ground upon which an adverse possession claim is made is the sort of interest of justice type of ground. The applicant is, for some other reason, entitled to be registered as proprietor. Remember, the courts and indeed the land registry have a fairly wide discretion as to what they can order in connection with registered titles. And in essence, uh, a high court judge or a county court judge can order whatever they wish, as long as it's in the interest of justice relating to a title. And the third limb is the interesting one. This is what I class as the sort of neighbour dispute type of objection. Sorry, uh, th this is the sort of neighbour dispute type of application that would preclude um, or would allow a claim for adverse possession to be made. The ground states the applicant has been in adverse possession of land adjacent to their own under the mistaken but reasonable belief that they are the owner of it. The exact line of the boundary with the adjacent land hasn't been determined and the estate to which the application relates was registered more than a year prior to the date of application. So let's just drill down and see what that means. The landowner that is claiming adverse possession must have a reasonable belief that they're the owner of it. What would a reasonable belief entail? Well, perhaps if there was a title plan, a defective title plan that appeared to show the land was in their ownership. If there was some other documentation from a reliable source that the land belonged to them, or where oral evidence can be produced to show that they have treated the land as their own, the sort of factual possession and intention to possess that we looked at uh, at the start of my presentation. In addition to that, the properties must be adjacent. Now, as far as adjacent is concerned, you know, what does that mean? Do they have to have a common boundary? Well, the answer would appear that it would make sense that that is the point. The boundary must not have been subject to a determined boundary application and the adverse possessor um, must have uh, owned the land for a period in excess of a year and the estate to which the application relates must have been registered more than a year prior to the date of application. So if you can satisfy all those criteria, then it is possible to succeed with a claim for adverse possession, notwithstanding objection. Important point before we leave this slide and go on to consider some further points. Where the land registry has a situation where there's an object, a job, objection, or where the applicant is proceeding on the basis of one of the three grounds that enables him to proceed, and there is a dispute, the land registry will refer the matter to a first tier tribunal. And it's important to understand and appreciate that if that is the case, then the tribunal has an entitlement to award costs. And those costs can be significant. 
So if you're acting for a paper title holder or an adverse possessor that's pushing an application that is contested and the land registry refer the matter to tribunal, this isn't a sort of a relaxed sort of process where there isn't a cost vulnerability. Far from it. And therefore, be very careful. Over the years, I've seen transactional property lawyers assisting clients and becoming embroiled in tribunal applications. And in the good old days, it wasn't that bad a thing on the basis that there wasn't a risk of costs. These days, there is quite a severe risk of cost, particularly if one of the parties has, is deemed to have behaved unreasonably. So in short, let's just re recap this slide. The general position is that if I, as a paper title owner, object to an adverse possession claim, the adverse possession claim will be rejected. The applicant will only succeed if they can establish an estoppel, if they can establish that in the interest of justice, the claim should proceed, or if the application is made on what I class as a neighbor ground, and the neighbor has a reasonable belief that the land belonged to the applicant. In those circumstances where the land registry is of the view that this is a dispute, they will refer the matter to tribunal. Before referring to tribunal, what you normally see is that the land registry give the parties an opportunity to settle or achieve some form of negotiated, uh, um, sort of um, a negotiated settlement. Interestingly, the parties are able to apply to tribunal direct, where they're of the view that that negotiation is not achieving anything or is a delaying tactic on the part of one or other of the parties. And further, in some cases, the land registry will play an active role in the negotiation process, and where the land registry officer is of the view that the parties aren't getting anywhere with regard to negotiation, they can immediately refer the matter to tribunal. The next thing I want to talk about is looking at the process of application being made by the applicant. And important to understand here that the statement of truth should explain the historical context relating to the land and should highlight whether there have been any litigation or other processes undertaken by either of the parties. It needs to confirm the land that is subject to the adverse possession claim is not held in trust and confirm the status of the paper title owner. Very important that the application, that the statement of truth is as full as is possible, giving as much information as is possible. What tends to happen is people focus in on the factual possession, the issue of intention to possess and deal with sort of factual issues rather than looking at the Land Registration Act 2002, Schedule 6, and just satisfying the land registry that the application meets all the requirements of Schedule 6. I mentioned this case of Hopkins against Beacon, which is an interesting case in which some um, caution needs to be expressed to practitioners where they're acting for a client who is objecting to a claim for adverse possession. In this case, the landowner set out his grounds for objection, but hadn't ticked the box on form NAP for the application to be dealt with in the Land Registration Act 2002. Had he done so, then the application would have failed unless one of the three grounds could have been established but a failure to tick the box was fatal in connection with the registered proprietor in doing or in failing to complete the appropriate box he precluded himself from uh, the land registry process that would require the applicant to establish one of the three grounds to enable the adverse possession claim to proceed pretty scary stuff that case again about filling in forms or advising clients who are filling in forms objecting to an adverse possession claim. Just before I go any further, there is something else that I just want to mention for a moment concerning the neighbour ground that I mentioned a little earlier. In the notes, I've given you two interesting cases, Zarb and Parry, 
an island group against Chowdhury. In essence, these cases touch on a point with regard to a neighbour ground that I forgot to mention and should have done a little earlier. Namely this, it is essential that when we talk about an applicant's reasonable belief, we satisfy the land registry that we've had that belief during the 10-year period to which the adverse possession claim relates. It isn't enough that we have a belief at the point of application, there must be a belief during the 10-year period. Now, the cases uh, conflict with one another. So what I've done there is sort of looked at the safe conclusion that can be made, namely that you bring a claim for adverse possession as soon as you can once your 10 years has elapsed. And secondly, that you show to the land registry that during that 10 year period, you believe that the land belongs to you. Even if you had a situation where you couldn't prove that, that wouldn't necessarily be fatal. But what I've done is looked at the cases and said, well, all right, assuming the worst, what's the position? Well, the worst is that you would have to show a, um, that you had reasonable belief for a 10 year period. So do watch out for certain issues relating to procedures, just going back to the issue of procedure. One, applications relating to land that could be highway will either be rejected or the land registry will not proceed with the portion of land that potentially could be highway. We've discussed in the past, highways authorities, uh, uh, maps, etc., are notoriously unreliable and potentially inaccurate and therefore where you are dealing with land that could be highway, be careful. Safest course of action is to exclude any land that could be highway. And also watch applications relating to land that's common land or village green. Again, the land registry are wary to allow adverse possession claims relating to such land. There's also some guidance on the DEFRA website about applications for adverse possession relating to common land or village green. Watch neighbour encroachment claims. As I say, as long as we can establish reasonable belief that the land is ours, as long as we are um, dealing with land that is land that has a common boundary, then there is a risk with regard to neighbour encroachment that Schedule 6 of the Land Registration Act 2002 makes the process a relatively simple one. Watch out for second applications in connection with adverse possession where there's been an application that's been unsuccessful or rejected and do make sure that you're warning landowners about the danger of adverse possession claims and the need to react and the need to make sure that forms are properly completed remember that nightmare case that we've just looked at a little earlier the next thing i want to talk about is adverse possession and rectification so far all i've given you is bad news from the position of a paper title owner that in essence we've got a major problem on our hands where we're subject to an adverse possession claim in essence i think there are a number of bits of good news that i can give you with regard to adverse possession one the fact that if we do have a paper title owner that does react Generally speaking, most applications are going to be rejected. Secondly, and this is very important, when a paper title is lost, Schedule 4 of the Land Registration Act 2002, paragraph 5, allows any interested party to apply for rectification of a title. So let me give you a situation. You're acting for a client who's selling some land, and all of a sudden you're aware that some of the title that's going to be sold has been subject to an adverse possession claim and the paper title has been lost. Section 4 says it is possible to refer the land registry to the application. If we can show that the possessory title was granted by the land registry due to a mistake. So where you've lost paper title and the client landowner wasn't aware that an adverse possession claim was made or didn't react to an adverse possession claim, and loses title, if we can show one, a procedural irregularity, or two, that the adverse possessor has lied in their statement of truth in connection with the application with regard to factual possession, lawful possession, or um, the uh, possession that uh, is adverse to the rights of the owner, or if we can show that the paper title owner 
was a t an owner that, to which an application could not be made, then we can ask the land registry to rectify the title. And that rectification would involve reinstatement of the original paper title and removal of the possessory title. You would have a period of six years from the date the title was lost to make that application. And remember, the land register is an open register, so you're entitled to look at an adverse possession claim and any evidence that's been submitted. So let me give you a scenario. You're acting for me, I'm selling my house, and as you're looking at title, etc., we become aware that four years ago, my neighbor made an adverse possession claim in connection with part of the garden. So if we're selling, we've got a choice. Either we sell, but exclude that part of the garden, which now is subject to a possessory title belonging to my neighbor, or we have a look in the schedule four at the application that was submitted to the land registry. And in doing that, we identify that the statement of truth submitted by my neighbor is far from a statement of truth. The neighbor has lied as to when he moved the fence, lied as to the location of the fence, etc. If I can establish that the statement of truth is not correct, if there was a procedural irregularity with regard to the application, such as the land registry communicated to me at the wrong address, so instead of uh, communicating with me at my address for service, a mistake was made as to the town or county where I resided, and therefore the communication was sent to the wrong address, in those circumstances, I can revisit the application on the basis of an application for rectification of the title under Schedule 4 of the Land Registration Act 2002. Normally, with a claim for rectification, the paper title owner, in other words, the adverse possessor, has to consent. But in these circumstances, that would not apply. The land registry or a court would not have to take into account whether the adverse possessor consents or not, because clearly they're not. In those circumstances, we can get our paper title back. Very important. I think the reason that the land registry is um, sort of been advertising this point over recent years is because the Land Registry can see that the 2002 Act relied on paper title owners reacting to adverse possession claims. And either they haven't because addresses for service haven't been kept up to date, or they haven't because they haven't understood what they are required to do, which surprises me given the fact that where the Land Registry do indicate that an adverse possession claim is made, the Land Registry are quite bold in the uh, explanation and advice that they give to paper title owners as to what they ought to do. But nonetheless, in both of those circumstances, it is possible to bring a claim for rectification to correct a mistake. Adverse possession and boundary issues. Again, I refer you to property protocols and the boundary dispute protocol. In this last week, I've had four emails from firms concerning um, boundary issues and boundary problems. Uh, transactional property lawyers who bought property and then realized there's a boundary issue. With regard to adverse possession and boundary issues, remember, one, the boundary condition requires reasonable belief the applicant owns the land. Where the applicant is a chancer and simply moved the fence in the hope that the neighbor does nothing or doesn't know how to react, that in itself will not be sufficient to claim adverse possession relating to the land. It is simply a reasonable belief, and in essence, the test is what is the adverse possessor saying in his statement of truth. When we are looking at an adverse possession claim leading to a boundary dispute, remember property protocols and the boundary dispute protocol highlights the fact that we've got to discard, in essence, our documentary evidence as to where the location of the boundary is, and instead we're relying on statements of truth from the adverse possessor and the paper title owner as to the correct position. Adverse possession and boundary issues are a pretty lethal combination from the perspective of a transactional property lawyer, because in essence you've got the risk of adverse possession and you've got the risk of a boundary dispute being mitigated. Remember the point that I've made to you in the past, 
never ever embark on litigation relevant to a boundary dispute without first having attempted some form of mediation to settle the dispute. And remember that a determined boundary application will not provide a means of sort of an informal or formal type of mediation courtesy of the land registry. Moving on if I can, because I am conscious of time and the fact that we need opportunities for questions. Um, adverse possession in unregistered land. I've just given you in the notes some information about lost or missing title deeds. In the good old days when I first started dealing with conveyancing, the land registry, if deeds or documents were missing and were original and we were submitting an application for first registration, if we had an epitome of title or an abstract of title that was marked, the land registry would be pretty relaxed about allowing the title to be registered. We'd certainly get a possessory title, we may even get an absolute title in some circumstances, depending on the situation as to who lost the title deeds and in what circumstances. These days, that isn't the case. You'd be lucky to get registered with anything at all where your client is not in occupation and where your client lost the deeds. Where the client is in occupation, the deeds were lost by lawyers or lenders, and you've got some form of evidential documentation to support what the original documents state, then you've got a chance. But be careful when dealing with a possessory title being sought on the basis of an application for first registration where deeds and documents have been lost. The land registry is so jumpy about fraud that I would always say that you've got an uphill battle to get anything registered at all. Leading me to section 62 of the Land Registration Act 2002, that states that where we have a possessory title that has been registered for 12 years and the proprietor is in possession of the land, we can upgrade. This is at the discretion of the land registry. So UT1 would need to be completed and I would advocate a statement of truth from the proprietor, the, the alleged original adverse possessor, as to what they have done with the land for that period of 12 years. But if you do that, then you can upgrade title. Conclusions. I've given you a case called Harkin against Notting Hill, uh, Notting Hill Genesis, 2019 case in the notes, at the end of the notes. The reason that I've mentioned this case quite simply is that it shows a number of potential problems relating to adverse possession claims. What you've had here was um, an argument about uh, a trust and the paper title being held by a trust and he also had an argument that the applicant had had land gifted to him and in essence what you had was a period of 12 years adverse possession by the original owner and then a second period of adverse possession in excess of 12 years by the applicant and in essence the position was that the land registry were quite satisfied and the court was quite satisfied that those two periods of occupation meant that there'd been a period of 12 years, meaning that the threshold that required to be satisfied, courtesy of the um, Limitation Act, had been met and an adverse possession claim could be made. Just showing you some of the interesting issues, really, that need to be explored when making an application for adverse possession. So what should practitioners be advising clients? One, the slightest hint of adverse possession in connection with a sale or purchase needs resolving quickly. From a seller's perspective, can I tidy it up? How do I tidy it up? It may mean either playing hardball and seeking an order of the court that the adverse possession is groundless and a declaration that the title belongs to the paper title owner. It may mean taking a pragmatic view and doing a deal with the potential adverse possessor, particularly where the adverse possessor is a neighbor. You know, can we sort things out? Can we just agree where the boundary fence or wall is and make a determined boundary application or enter into a formal boundary agreement with each other that's noted on our registered titles? That way we can say to a prospective buyer, there was a dispute, that dispute has now been resolved and indeed finalized. From a buyer's perspective, three things. One, be very wary about any adverse possession claim, actual or potential, that may impact on value of the property or impact on client objective. Two, be
be wary about buying litigation. In other words, we want the position resolving one way or the other before we proceed to an exchange of contract. Three, make sure that paper title owners are defensive, that, protect, that paper title owners know about adverse possession, know about the risk of adverse possession, know how to practically defeat a claim before it arises and what to do if a claim is made. So I think what we have to do is heighten awareness to our clients who are buying land. Once we've bought it, just be alive to the fact that any encroachment by a neighbour, any use by a third party may run the risk of adverse possession. And just advising clients to contact us in circumstances where they're suspicious that any risk in fact arises. So in short, a number of points to take away from us today. One, if we're acting for a seller, and there's a risk or a potential, potential or actual adverse possession, tidy things up before we sell. From a buyer's perspective, make sure that we're not buying litigation and the seller's done their job and tidied up. Word of caution on applications for first registration. If there is a risk of adverse possession or a hint that adverse possession could be made, I would disclose that to the land registry in connection with my application for first registration. And in short, as I always say to practitioners, do the simple things well, addresses for service up to date, informing clients about risk relating to adverse possession, checking documentation, checking client inspection to see if there is anything that, that is revealed to us that would warrant further investigation about potential problems. Steve, I'm conscious of time. I'm also conscious of the fact that I haven't asked Robert any questions today. Robert, uh, as far as product is concerned, what do you have available that could assist practitioners with regard to some of the points that we've explored this morning? Well, thanks, Ian. Yeah, a number really for exactly that point you were just making about preparing your title for sale. Uh, yeah. We have a number of policies there for adverse possession where you've got a registered title, but also occupying some unregistered land next door. Um, so that's always available. We often find that actually, when people start talking about adverse possession, it, it can turn out to be there's missing title deeds rather than adverse yeah. possession. They have lost the paper title. So again, yeah. that's a separate policy there. And uh, for simple setups, they're always available online. If anything's a bit more complicated, obviously then our bespoke team can look at it and fashion a policy around there. Um, yeah. The areas where we find probably the, the the issue is, it's actually the intention to possess and proving that uh, yeah. from activity in the past. It's quite easy to think that, you know, the bit of land at the back of your garden is yours, but what have yeah. you done to actually show you regarded as yours? And uh, there have been, as you know, a number of cases recently to talk about things as simple as mowing the lawn and so on yes. uh, can yeah. be shown to be intention to possess. So that's yeah. normally where we need more input from the client and from their lawyers is, is actually proving yeah. that intention to possess. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for that, Robert. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the interesting thing. There are standard policies, but as Robert just alluded to, there are bespoke policies that fit where, you, you know, you're of the view that uh, the standard policy might not fit the peculiar circumstances. So thanks for that, Robert. Steve, question time. Is there much? Are there many? Yes, thanks, Ian. Um, thank you to everyone that submitted a question uh, so far. We're now going to begin the Q&A uh, for the session. Um, I'm not going to actually invite any more questions, if that's right, Ian, because we have had plenty in, as you <laughs> might be um, aware. But anyway, we'll start off with uh, Heather Palmer. Heather asks, would, so this is going right back to the start of your presentation, actually, and this came in very early. Um, would intention be shown if one could show that you thought you owned it, I think it being the land, as part of the property you bought? Uh, yeah, if it was reasonable to do so. Was it Heather that asked that question, Steve? That's correct, yes. Yeah, yeah uh, Heather. The position is that if, it, if, if there was reasonable evidence in the deeds to enable to have that view, then yes, that would be enough. So, um, in, in short, yeah, it, it, if the deeds, you know, if, if there was a, a defective plan or something that showed you own it, then you would have a reasonable belief that that belonged to you. Unless, of course, your lawyer advised you that, hey, that's defective and that bit of land isn't included. But subject to that, then, yeah, 
uh, that sort of thing would be sufficient. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. And thanks, Heather, for that question. Um, Ian asks, can, a, can an owner unilaterally grant consent in order to prevent time from continuing to run? This would be cheaper than a claim for trespass. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can regularise the position by providing consent or, or regularising the position by way of licence or some form of tenancy, which is, a, again, a, short, a way of short-circuiting the problem. So that was a good question from Ian, and yeah, that is a solution. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, as well. Um, a follow-up question from Ian as well, actually slightly separate issue, but uh, with regards to the Limitation Act, Ian, so ho hopefully your knowledge on that is, is very strong. Um, where is the 30-year adverse possession point that you referred to in the Limitation Act? Which section? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've picked me up so I can fall there, haven't you? Um, I can't tell you the relevant section. Um, I have to dig it out. But if Ian wants to drop me a note, I'll dig it out for him. Absolutely, Thanks. no problem. And thanks, thanks again, Ian. Yeah. Um, question from Josh. Josh asks, if an owner of land is fully aware that mines and minerals are severed from the property and therefore have no mistaken knowledge of ownership, would this yeah. automatically defeat an adverse possession claim for mines and minerals brackets against a registered mines and minerals title owner? Hey, Steve, I've had a question that I know the answer to. This is great. Um, I've done a lot of work <laughs> on mines and minerals over the years, lots and lots of work. And when I first looked at this, I thought, how on earth can you claim adverse possession for mines and minerals? So I asked the land registry about it. This is going back a number of years. What they said was this. Imagine a situation where you own the surface to a piece of land and mines and minerals beneath are excluded. Those mines and minerals do not belong to the Crown, but belong to a third party. If there was, on your land, a mine shaft with tunnels going beneath your property that enabled you to access the mines and minerals beneath, you could claim adverse possession to the mines and minerals that you could work via that shaft and tunnel. So, in short, the answer to the question is, it is possible to bring a claim for adverse possession relating to mines and minerals. But the fact that you own the surface above it would not be sufficient to claim adverse possession. You would have to show that you had some form of facility that enabled you to access the mines and minerals, not necessarily for extra extraction purposes, but just that you could access, access them. Because when I said the land registry is, well, all right, let's assume that I'm lucky enough to have a shaft and a tunnel in my land that say enables me to access limestone beneath it then surely i work the limestone either side of the tunnel by say two meters so my tunnel starting off at two meters in width is now uh, six meters in width that enables me to extract in essence the next two meters of limestone and i can just go on continually to the perimeters of my title and the land registry the officer that I was speaking to was said that, yeah, that's exactly right. Mines and minerals, to be honest with you, are a minefield. What, what I always say to practitioners is this. Whenever you're acting for a, in a residential transaction, a client that in, intends to undertake some form of subterranean activity, then advise the client of the need for the appropriate geological search to identify what mines and minerals are beneath the property. And then it's also possible to identify who owns them either because the mines and minerals are registered under a separate title number or they are unregistered. There is a register of ownership of mines and minerals that's um, retained by a company of geologists. So you can get maps that show, uh, say, limestone sitting beneath your title and also who owns it. But it's a great question. But in short, to answer the question, you'd only be able to claim adverse possession for mines and minerals beneath your property if you were to able to access them from your property. That wouldn't necessarily mean you're digging a, a shaft and a tunnel. If you did that, you'd have to wait a period of 10 years before your claim for adverse possession would succeed. Convoluted answer, Stephen, but hopefully an answer that answers the question for once. No, absolutely. That's, that's really interesting. Thanks, Ian. And thanks, Josh, for the great question. I think also I'd, I'd have to look this up and maybe follow up the notes, but I'm pretty sure when I mean, you were saying there's a register, I think there's some software as well that you can use to identify 
um, minor visual uh, yeah, reservations yeah. there as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so Nigel asks, can a leaseholder claim adverse possession on behalf of or for the benefit of its freeholder? Um, that's a great question. And there's conflicting case law, to be honest with you. In short, as far as the land, assuming it's registered land, um, the answer to the question is yes. But with regard to unregistered land, I think the position is unclear. Um, the only point that I would make with regard to that is why would the leaseholder do it? The freeholder could make an application, in essence, on the basis of his leaseholder's adverse possession. I think that would be the way to approach it, with the simplest way to approach it. But to answer the question, yes. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian, and thanks, Nigel, for that question. Um, thanks, Nigel. Just, just a, a, a point rather than a question that uh, yeah. Brian Johnson uh, raises. Yeah. So just based on your uh, the, the neighbour condition you were talking about a, a while ago, yeah. in uh, Dow's and Bradford City Council 2020 was a potentially yeah. good case there. If people wanted to look into yeah, that a bit further. Yeah, thanks, Brian. There's, there's, to be honest, there's loads of good cases, but that is a good one. Um, yeah, that you could look at. But the, the idea of this, you know, concept of you know, a neighbour application, people sort of look at it and think, oh, well, as long as I'm a neighbour, I can make the application. There is this condition of reasonable belief, but that is a case you could utilise to uh, explain just what reasonable belief is, in addition to the cases that I mentioned in the notes. Thanks, Brian. Good point. Perfect. Thank you. We have about uh, three, possibly more, four more questions. I'm going to press on, Ian. I appreciate that we are well above the hour. So, I mean, yeah. thank you to everyone that has stayed on but as we have three or four i think we'll we'll close off after that yeah um so uh jeanette asks where someone is in possession such as incorporating an area into a garden can you simply give a letter of consent to the adverse occupier and thereby negate his ability to say he occupies without consent right so we've got someone in occupation who's been there five years or so you just want to preclude an adverse possessions claim by saying i consent to your uh possession um theoretically that would work theoretically it would work on the basis that he's now possessing without the owner's consent so yeah i wouldn't object to that course of action Perfect, thanks Ian. Thank you, Jeanette, for that question. Thanks, yeah. um, uh, Sally asks, uh, in regards to executors, so what about uh, executors claiming unregistered land where deeds uh, lost but uh, got evidence, brackets, photos, etc., and letter from the former owner of the land that it was transferred to the deceased 20 plus years ago, for example? Right, so what we have is a situation where executives don't have personal knowledge of the adverse possession, but they've got a letter confirming from the landowner that adverse possession took place. Is that is that right, Steve? Is that am I reading that correctly? That's how I'm reading that, Ian. Yeah. yeah in, in, those, in those circumstances, uh, what I, I think it would be possible for the estate to bring a claim for adverse possession. The only thing that would they'd need is that some they need a statement from truth from someone to confirm the position on the ground, to confirm that the deceased what the deceased was possessing, and evidence that you know which, which in essence would be hearsay but nonetheless potentially admissible to the land registry that the deceased treated the land as their own. So not only were there, it was their factual possession but there was an intention to possess um adverse to the rights of the owner so i think you, you know if there was um I'm just trying to think you know someone like a gardener someone like a neighbor or a friend that sort of visited frequently that could say yeah i saw the deceased cutting the grass the deceased told me that they'd been in occupation for x number of years etc etc with that sort of thing that i'd be looking for perfect thanks but, but it to answer the question the executive could bring a claim for adverse possession on behalf of the estate. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, we, we have them right at the very start. I think almost just as the webinar was uh, beginning, it's a preemptive mm -hmm. question, perhaps. But uh, mm -hmm. from Edward, and Edward asks, can you tell me whether a claim for adverse possession in 
relation to registered land can be frustrated by the owner by sending a case and deceased letter to the trespassers before 10 years have expired in order to remove the reasonable mistake ground. Does anything need to be done after this? So I think I was talking to Robert with this offline to suggest maybe something that's ongoing actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, the position there is that if you were to send that letter, then that would certainly give you an opportunity to object on the if the applicant made the claim for adverse possession on the basis basis of a neighbour claim. Uh, on the of course, you then say, well, you couldn't have reasonable grounds to think the land belonged to you because you had a letter from me saying it belonged to me. So I think yeah, that that would that that would potentially prevent the neighbour ground being relied upon. My guess would be, in those circumstances, however, the land registry might refer the matter to tribunal, and the tribunal to determine whether, whether, what that letter did and how that impacted on the position of the adverse possessor with regard to their reasonable grounds. Thank you. Thanks, yep. Ian, and thank you, Edward, for that question. We, we actually we do have questions still coming through and a few others, so I'm, I'm actually going to close off there but anyone that has submitted yeah. a question we haven't answered it we will get back to you um yeah, Steve, privately what I was gonna, what I was suggest, Steve, if there are lots of questions i do have a bit of time this week so i could sit down and have a look at them and sort of share with you and if you could share with everyone else that would be brilliant that would be great yeah thank you yeah. it'd be very very helpful okay thank you so thank you to everyone for um attending today and for submitting questions um, and as i say we will be uh, in contact to those who have asked questions and, and we haven't been able to get to. Um, that just leads me to sum up for today. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, we have included links in the chat section to our YouTube channel and LinkedIn page. Please do give us a like or subscribe if you use these platforms. We will be sending out a follow up email. My colleague Robert will be sending this email that will include the recording and the slides uh, and the notes for today's session so please look out for that in the next 24 to 48 hours um so that's just even say on behalf of stuart title in quail myself and robert kelly thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day thanks and goodbye <laughs>